wait now for Mark Vandermolen, who is now connecting to our interview this time. We're talking about culture, law, education. Can you hear me, Mark? I can. Can you hear me, Don? Excellent. Could you open us with prayer? Will do. I'm going to read. Read from uh, the, the URCNA's uh, Forms and Prayers book, and this is a prayer for all in civil authority. Okay. Almighty God, whose kingdom alone is everlasting and whose power alone is infinite, have mercy upon our land. Grant to our leaders and all others in authority wisdom, righteousness, and strength to know and to do your will. So rule their hearts that they, knowing whose servants they are, may above all seek your honor and glory. Enable us to know whose authority they bear, and therefore faithfully and obediently honor them according to your blessed word and ordinance. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns forever, one God, world without end. Amen. Amen. Good to have you back. I note that Brett McAtee, I think I'm saying that right, his book yes. arrives today. Okay, wonderful. So you've spiked a real interest, something that doesn't get discussed ever hmm. in my quarters, my orbit, and needs to be discussed. Anyways, we're talking about R2K. And can you summarize and open us to where you want to take the ship? You're the captain on the bridge. Okay. Um, well, when we talked last time, we had kind of just essentially talked about R2K as essentially setting off life into two realms. One is a grace realm and one is a common realm. That grace realm is reduced essentially to the church, and that is governed by God's word. The common realm is really everything else in life, and that is to be governed by natural law. And it isn't necessarily to be specifically Christian, uh, but you can make appeals to natural law in order to for the magistrate to govern. Uh, and in particular, I think we mentioned Scott Clark uh, indicates that really it's only the second table of natural law that applies. Speaking of that for a moment, uh, Dr. Clark was invited to interview you. He declined. And I had a couple follow-up questions of clarification. Uh, what before we continue on with what you were mentioning? Uh, do you have a good relationship with Dr. Cornelius Venema? I do. Yes, I enjoy my relationship with him. Do you have a good relationship with Dr. Vander Hart? Yes. Reverend Vanderhart's a very sweet man, wonderful preacher, uh, great professor uh, at Mid America. <clears throat> do you have a good relationship with Mid America? I do. I support and promote them uh, all the time. Have done so. Uh, I've gone to their library quite often uh, and uh, taken advantage of their resources there and uh, stop in and chat with the professors. So they, they are, it's a wonderful seminary. Are you an elder in the URCNA? I am. Okay. Those questions are on the record for the record. Um, anyways, proceed with, I'm sorry to interrupt you there, but we needed that clarification given a set of circumstances statements that were made not a problem donald uh i was going to get into and in fact when i re-listened to our first interview i saw i had started talking about something regarding belgic 36 and i think i went off on a different trail and i didn't get to what i was going to talk about um and belgic 36 is where it talks about the role of the magistrate and that his ruling is to be quote subject to the law of god unquote and of course, Dr. Clark uses that to just say, well, that means subject to the second table of natural law. And what I was going to get into, and as, as you know, and as a historical theologian would know, uh, if you look at, okay, what was the meaning of this confessional provision or that confessional provision, let's say with the Westminster Confession, we have minutes of the assembly. 
So if you have minutes of the assembly of Westminster, you can go to them. They certainly can shed light uh, on the discussions that led to the adoption of provisions. Uh, I have done some research and found we also have a nice historical document that accompanies the revision to Belgic 36 that occurred that we currently in the URC hold to. Uh, the revision to Belgic 36, as I had indicated in the pre previous interview, had removed the idea of the magistrates suppressing heresy, but yet retained that the magistrate still is to rule according to God's law. And the question that arises with if an R2K fellow is positing, well, that only means the second table and that there really should be no interest by the magistrate in the first table, what does the historical record say? And interestingly, as that was being developed, I went through the historical record and in 1958, the Synod of the CRC uh, at the same time that they adopted this revised Belgic, also adopted at the same synod a declaration on the relationship of church and state. So they did a more fulsome explanation of why they were making the change to Belgic 36 and yet affirming particular truths about the relationship of church and state. And I just wanted to read to you provision number one. Provision number one adopted in 1958 is that in the matter of the relationship of church and state, Synod declares that in agreement with the confession of the churches represented in its midst, it maintains that the magistrate is instituted by God and is endowed with power in order that on its part and within the limits set for its authority, promote the maintenance of human life and its development and here come the key words, in agreement with both tables of the law of God. <laughs> so, you know, I, I've read material that Dr. Clark has written on the revision to Belgic 36. I've never yet seen him address this. He's never addressed that accompanying historical statement that says this is in agreement with both tables of the law of God. Um, As a counter objection, how would Dr. Since he's absent by his own will, how do you think he would counter your, your position of historical illumination? Um, okay, you're asking me to make the argument for Dr. Clark. Um, well, Cicero would do that. Yes, so, I, 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 I get it. Um, I'm not sure exactly how he would respond to that because he hasn't addressed it. I do know that he just continues to maintain the idea that it is, you know, the magistrate enforcing, he always, like I, I think I said previously, he would always keep coming back to, but the magistrate still is not to quote enforce the first table of the law. And by that, I think he means based on looking at his other writing that he means that the magistrate would come make you Donald Beach or Mark Vandermullen attend a particular church with a particular confession and that they would be enforcing uh, that upon us. Uh, what I've been indicating is, is that the first table of the law still has certain restraining influence upon the actions of the magistrate. Uh, and interestingly, I have read an entry by Dr. Clark where he says, well, there it could be an argument to make that the magistrate could set aside in conformity with uh, the fourth commandment to set aside a day of rest. In other words, like the old blue laws. Yes. So he's even conceded that. So once you concede that, we've already moved into the first table of the law. Uh, and again, now let's talk about the third commandment. Do not take the Lord's name in vain. If you look at how the Heidelberg Catechism explains that, uh, it talks about whether you could be taking oaths. And the Catechism says, well, certainly, Christians, you can take oath when the government requires you to do so in the interests of truth. So even there, and I think the um, Westminster Confession, I looked at that briefly before this meeting, the Westminster Confession also talks about the sins forbidden in the third commandment, one of them being perjury. 
well, perjury is talking about someone testifying in court and the magistrate has an interest in truth telling. Uh, so again, now we move to the third commandment. You know, Dr. Reading for my catechism. Yes. Um, they say there was always something fearful to a Scottish minister when an elder reached for the Westminster standards in the pew as the minister was speaking. <laughs> in other words, he's checking up on the minister. That's right. That's right. Uh, that third commandment's a lot wider than just mere perjury. That's under Title 18, I believe. Right. You'd know that better. Uh, it's quest question uh, 113 of the larger catechism. Of the larger catechism, I'm thumbing there. Uh, the sins forbidden, not using God's name as required. Can you imagine that as a law? Right. By the civil magistrate? Right. Um, is it a misdemeanor or felony? Uh, to avoid ignorant, vain, profane, superstitious, wicked mentioning of God's titles, attributes, and works. Well, that takes us right over into the educational arena where God has been banished. Right, right. The civil magistrate has banished and profaned the name of God. Yes. Or pushed it over, you know, if you Christians want to do it, you can have your home schools and public schools, but we're not using public tax dollars to support schools. And so mm -hmm. kids are raised without the fear of God and are taught implicitly profanation. Yes, they are. And how does Dr. Clark even deal with this as a Westminster man? Sinful cursings, misapplying the word, maintaining false doctrines. Yeah, there, there's much in there, and some of it, you know, I'm I'm trying to be very narrow, uh, and just saying, you know, because his is a categorical exclusion, and I'm saying, is do our confessions make a categorical exclusion? Oh. And I and and I see that there are all sorts of provisions in here uh, that the magistrate certainly does have an interest in, and and in fact, if you know, some of my clients, I've seen clients, uh, not some of my clients, but I've seen other men in court that are defendants in court and they they commence to start profaning and doing things that are injurious uh even verbally the courts can immediately hold them in contempt uh so if there's this vain swearing uh even if it isn't necessarily a direct perjury the magistrate has an interest in the proper upholding of you know, not misusing the name of God. Someone comes in and starts swearing in the name of God, the court is going to deal with that. Um, you know, that's the third commandment. Then you start looking at, okay, well, what, what interest does the magistrate have in the second and first commandment? You know, in other words, no other gods before me and making no idols. Well, what's the idol of our day? The idol of our day is secular humanism and the idolatry of sexual perversion uh, in, in other words, all of that is there. Now, does the magistrate have anything to say about that? Well, we had the Biden White House, I think, after they signed this, uh, quote, Respect for Marriage Act, uh, which is a ironically named title to an act, they lit up the White House with the gay rainbow colors. So you have the magistrate affirmatively celebrating the idol of our day. There, there was a statute that just went up, a statue just went up in, um, I can't remember, some public park, but the magistrate was involved with it. And it was a statue honoring Ruth Bader Ginsburg, of course, who was the high priest, high priestess of abortion, who sat on the Supreme Court. Well, they put up a, a statute. And if you look at the statute, it's a grotesque thing. It has a bunch of symbolism and arms and uh, tentacles coming out. Uh, and the image was very demonic. Uh, so you have drag queen story hour at public uh, libraries. Public libraries, again, are public institutions, government-run institutions, and they're having drag queen story hour celebrating, celebrating the idol of our day. So does 
the first table of the law, at least tell them and restrain them from celebrating idolatry and putting that on the throne over against God? I think it does. I had a, I have a friend, a German reform man, who went down in Lexington, North Carolina, to a public or a drag queen show in a public library and he organized christians to go down to it and the mayor of lexington threatened the rector minister with arrest for disorderly conduct uh, a cover charge to exclude him from being there in collar um uh, so he, in order to avoid having his head on the chopping block, sent down Christians from his church who went. And of the 300 churches in Lexington of all manner, sort, and variety, only his church was representative. And his point was being the fecklessness, the ineffectiveness, the non-involvement of the churches in Lexington. So the show went on with protest, but I don't see how Dr. Godfrey, Dr. Clark or others can avoid the very catechism they've been sworn to uphold. Do you think Dr. Clark just inserts this willy nilly, the second table of the commandment or? Well, again, I think it goes back on back to something we touched on in the first is that uh, their paradigm requires them in reaction to theonomy. Theonomy, of course, wants to ensconce maybe too much uh, in terms of the judicial laws, et cetera, and the law of God as written in scripture. So they react to that. And so we can't have anything that looks like setting up a theocracy so therefore, their paradigm requires them to kind of remove the first table interest for the magistrate uh, and then don't necessarily appeal to uh, the inscripturated word or the actual Decalogue, uh, but appeal to natural law. Uh, so, you know, I think it's, it's a product of their, their mind and their thinking under this paradigm. Uh, and it's, I think, difficult for them to think outside of that. So is it intentional on their part? I don't know. All I can tell you is this kind of leads to another confessional provision uh, in the Canons of Dort. The Canons of Dort speak about the sufficiency, or I should say the insufficiency of natural law. Canons of Dort, Head of Doctrine 3.4, Article 4, uh, has a provision that talks about the light of nature that remains in man. And the canons say, quote, but so far as this light of nature from being sufficient to bring him to a saving knowledge of God and to true conversion, that he is incapable of using it aright, even in things natural and civil. By no means further, this light, such as it is, man in various ways renders wholly polluted and hinders in unrighteousness, which by doing he becomes inexcusable before God. But that key provision is talking about the noetic effects of sin uh, and how much it has polluted man. And they even get so far as, and of course, we all agree, and as the confession indicates, that we certainly, that light of nature is not going to bring us to salvation, uh, to a true knowledge and faith in God. But it goes so far, the canon say, is that we are incapable of using it aright, even in things civil and natural. So I, I how, thought that phrase, civil and natural. Right. So, so how does that work out uh, if you hold to that confession uh, to then say we are going to, and we believe it is sufficient, that we are going to just say it is sufficient for the magistrate and for culture to operate just based on natural law, on the natural light remaining in man. I will say this, Dr. Clark has dealt with that provision, and I'll read you what it is that he wrote. He says, quote, what about the clause, incapable of using it aright, even in things natural and civil? 
he asks rhetorically, a right to what end? The context is salvation. The article speaks of salvation just before that clause and just after it. It seems odd to insist that the delegates were rejecting the use of natural law in civil life. Okay, that, that's his answer as to how he handles that. First of all, the confession is not rejecting the use of natural law completely, categorically. It is talking about the insufficiency of natural law alone being able to govern civil life. So that is a red herring that he throws out, suggesting that someone is arguing that natural law is not a thing. Of course, it's a thing. It exists. It can be used, but in itself alone, we need the spectacles of scripture to correctly read general revelation. And then the irony of it is, is when he asks the rhetorical question. Which governors and legislators and others and educators need those spectacles. Yes. Lest they repress by nature that dynamic instinct to repress even revelation in nature. Right, exactly. Um, you know, that's what Calvin talked about. Scripture is the spectacles to be able to read general revelation. It's yeah. needed because of the noetic effects of sin. But what I just find very odd is that he asks the rhetorical question after quoting the language that says, incapable of using it aright, even in things natural and civil. And then he asks, a right to what end? And my answer is, in things natural and civil. The clause itself answers this question. To what end? In things natural and civil. It's right there. So he has to just not even deal with that and just say, no, that's only in the context of salvation, even though the confession, the clear language of the confession itself is saying, no, that natural light is insufficient. To what end? In things civil and natural. Uh, so that that's another problematic thing, you know, um, it essentially too, you know, you look at this in terms of, and we talked about this, the collapse of Christendom and the collapse of the Christian consensus in culture. Um, and to me, that collapse is really exposing the bankruptcy of an R2K paradigm that says, natural law is sufficient, don't appeal the scripture. We, we have today, as you know, men saying they can be women. Uh, we have a sitting Supreme Court justice now who during her confirmation hearing was asked the question, what is a woman? She would not answer the question. And she said, I'm not a biologist. By the way, as an outgrowth, I'm getting some internet, still... internet problems on my side. Okay, uh, where did I leave off? Well, I was going to add to that, that as an out offspring or offshoot of our discussion, I've been in touch with Dr. Joe Moorcraft. Hmm. We're going to talk about federal vision, but he says he's a theonomist. So... Right we're going to get to that issue. Um, I'm with you. Um, we get to, where, who in the reformed world has a position of confrontation with secular humanism? It's a great question. I, I look at the state of the reformed church. Um, you know, there are good faithful men that are standing up. Um, I don't know if it's a product of our generation, maybe it's getting tired uh, and doesn't want to believe that they have to continue to have these uh, church disputes. Um, I, I am seeing, uh, and I am encouraged by, I'm seeing a number of younger men that are taking up this, this, uh, this battle. Uh, and I think I had pointed out one fellow to you, Aldo Leon, he's a, um, yes, a, a PCA pastor. Uh, he's a graduate of Westminster Seminary, California, but he himself 
uh, is putting out material in critique of it. Uh, so I'm, and I've seen another uh, couple fellows have a podcast called um, Once for All Delivered. Uh, one of them is a West Cal grad. One is a Mid-America grad. Uh, they have a podcast together and they've done examination uh, of this. So there's some younger guys that they've been under this teaching and they're looking at it critically. Uh, but, you know, this comes back to uh, the prophetic voice of the church. Who is to be the prophetic voice of the church? Well, you know, if we're being taught not to be that prophetic voice and that we can't thunder God's word uh, to the magistrate calling him to account, um, well, then the church will be fairly weak. Uh, can, I thought, can, can you, after we're done here today, send me <clears throat> those two names of Leon and the, yes. the podcast so I can include that in our notes. Absolutely. You know, I, I'm just looking at how the, you know, the reformers, the reform tradition uh, has always had a very strong prophetic voice uh, to culture, to the magistrate. You look at the fact that John Calvin's preface to the institutes itself uh, was written to King Francis, right? Yeah. And in his preface, he says to him, now that king who in ruling over his realm does not serve God's glory. Oh, that sounds like first table. Uh-oh. Exercises not kingly rule, but robbery as abandoned. Furthermore, he is deceived who looks for enduring prosperity in his kingdom when it is not ruled by God's scepter, his holy word. That's John Calvin speaking to King Francis in the preface to the Institutes of the Christian religion, which good, solid, reformed men uphold. Uh, I'm going to give you another Machen quote. Um, you know, when we look at the collapse of society and the collapse of the Christian consensus in terms of culture, in terms of law, what did Machen say in his book, A Christian View of Man? He says, quote, what then is the remedy for the threatened disruption of society and for the rapidly progressing decay of liberty? There is only one remedy. It is the rediscovery of the law of God. Amen to that. I'm going back to the educational arena. That's one of several areas. The collapse of law. Uh, to a quote by Professor A. A. Hodge towards the last, well, he died 1880, I think. Here's what he says. I am sure as I am of the fact of Christ's reign that a comprehensive and centralized system of national education separated from religion <clears throat> as is now commonly proposed, will prove the most appalling engine of the propagation of anti-Christian and atheistic unbelief and anti-social nihilistic ethics, individual, social, and political, which this sin-rent world has ever seen. So we want to maybe, as an outgrowth of this, continue to network with the, the people you mentioned um, and continue somehow to set up an outline of discussion points that we could elaborate. You've certainly made the point on the fourth, the third, and the second commandment of the first table with the magistrate. And, you know, it was sticking with this educational arena, I know uh, reform churches have been distinctive in the Grand Rapids area for Christian schools, thank God. Uh, yes. But is it not an act of public theft that my tax dollars go to support schools where God has been profaned abused, neglected, denied, and banished from public discourse. My, yes. my, my parents in Canada 
uh, attended public schools and they did the Lord's Prayer every morning. They read a chapter of scripture and they would pull a collect from Cranmer's prayer book. And that was every morning. Wow. That's long gone today. Right, right. Well, Hodge, A.A. A. Hodge was quite prophetic there as far as it, uh, you know, being the engine of nihilistic ethics. Well, the only way to avoid nihilistic ethics is a return to the law of God. And that's what we've turned away from. Yes. And you're a good quote from Machen. Uh, this is really only the only remedy is the rediscovery of God's law. Right, right. So now, to show, you give me a second here, um, what these secularists were really at 100 years ago. Uh, here's Dr. Uh, Chester Pierce, trying to get out of the sunlight there. Every child in America entering public school at the age of five is mentally ill. Mm. Because he comes to school with certain allegiances toward our founding fathers, toward our elected officials, toward his parents, towards a supernatural being, toward the sovereignty of this nation as a separate entity. It's up to you teachers to make sure all these sick children will be well by creating international children of wow. the future without God, Dr. Chester Pierce. And we're just talking about education. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. not even, you know, and I, I wanted to raise, we've only got about five, six minutes here. There's things like critical race theory, abortion, gay marriage, Marxism, gender pronouns i just heard a story of a canadian pastor who's in jail because his child wanted to tra be transgender and use new pronouns and he said no and i haven't verified this but this is the report that he's serving jail time so yes i've, yeah. I've seen it i've seen it in the in the u.s as well um i think a father was uh, trying to get uh, prevent his uh, ex-wife who had custody of a child. He was trying to stop that mother of the child from uh, doing uh, transition surgery and hormones and things of that nature. And he lost the the courts of the of the land sided with the mother who was going to mutilate the child. Well, I think. Brother, we need some kind of reformation in this particular area in the Reformed churches. Forget the Anglicans. You know, that's a whole other line of inquiry, my orbit. And I, I am now publicly recommending. There's some Reformed kids, young people, who see the attraction of Cranmer's prayer book and don't realize that the Reformed have their own prayer books that are solid and reformational, Reformed. And so they get kind of giggly. Well, I'm standing at the, the door of American Anglican context and warning those youngsters, stay where you're at. Stick with the confessions. Mm -hmm. My name is Cranmer's prayer book. You got Monday to Saturday and start doing a lot of research. Right. I can't right. surrender the reformational uh, reform, not Lutheran, reformed confessions. Right. Um, so you're doing your you're doing your PhD work on Cranmer. I am. OK. What's your, want, what's your target date? Uh, <laughs> kind of open ended. Uh, my wife just finished her doctorate. My son did this year. So the pressure's on me at the family level. I could yeah. probably finish it in six to nine months. Um, I want to press beyond it, get it done and maybe move over into another area on the inerrancy and infallibility of scripture mm. and trace the history of that. I know the general theme that I'd be going for, but I'm kind of digging around on where that's been weakened, such as on this point. Yes. The authority of God said, that's, that's the start of the 10 commandments. God didn't suggest God said and commanded. 
Right, right. We we need to see the unity of God's law, right? Um, you know, yeah. you, you, you break one, you've broken all of them. I mean, you know, in a sense, you know, you can commit a, a crime against, you know, you can murder, but yet there's there's still something that is idolatrous about that. There's something very self-centered about it. Uh, and you have, you know, to have an R2K paradigm that decapitates, you know, the head of the law, uh, the head, you know, the first table off the body of the law. I mean, you can just see the interaction, uh, just, just reading the confession and the sins forbidden in each of these commands, you can see, oh, well, that also touches on this commandment. That also touches on that commandment. Uh, you know, you can't just bifurcate things like that. Uh, well, certainly, go ahead. Back to that educational piece, you're murdering children, so to speak. Yeah. Profane yeah. in the sixth and profaning God in the third and right. naming him in the second and yeah. uh, and stealing from us in terms of our public tax monies. Right. Um, it's wow. a beautiful. It's a beautiful unity, uh, you know, and I, I don't like to see the law chopped up that way. Uh, and then just to see really the way culture has gone, this whole idea that we are in a society now that has some consensus on the basis of natural law is just, it's becoming so obviously ridiculous, but they hold, but they hold on to the paradigm. Brother, we need to bring it to a close. And we'll have a, maybe a minute or a minute and a half afterwards, a prayer for the president of the United States and all others in authority. Let us pray. Lord, our heavenly father, the high and mighty ruler of the universe, who dost from thy throne behold all dwellers upon earth. Most heartily we beseech thee with favor to bless those in service Mr. Biden, President of the United States, our representatives in Congress assembled, the governors of our states and everyone else in authority. So replenish them with the grace of thy Holy Spirit that there may be evangelical repentance unto life and the exercise of saving faith that as a result, they may incline to thy will, the Ten Commandments, and walk in thy faith and the fear of thy great name, and do them with these redemptive benefits, grant them in health and prosperity long to live, and finally, uh, based on your grace after this life, render to everlasting joy and felicity. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the sovereign of this globe and cosmos, our Redeemer. Amen. Amen, Donald. A couple of uh, adjustments on that old prayer. Yes, I, I, I noticed. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's get together again when we can. I'm looking forward to maybe going through McCaddy's book chapter by chapter thinking it out, talking to Dr. Moorcraft and some others, talking to Brett McAtee again. Am I saying his name right? McAtee. 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 Okay. Yes. Talking to him and seeing what we can do. Yeah, that's right. No, I'd, I'd be happy to. And I'm again, I would still put it out there. I'd be happy to have a, a debate with Dr. Clark and he could be invited again. Obviously, he doesn't seem interested. Uh, but by the same token, I would be happy to do that. He was invited and he was very firm. He doesn't want to debate you. I got you. That's that. Anyway, yep. moving on. We'll see you later, brother. All right. Thank you, Donald. Good to see you. Bye.